Okay, good morning, everyone. Today is going to be all about the helium atom. And specifically, we're going to be doing the helium atom ground state energy. So a couple of comments about that. First is that we are going to be ignoring two facts about the helium atom that are not obviously ignorable. One is that the helium atom has two electrons and they're identical. So uh, electrons are identical. And the second thing we're going to be ignoring about the electrons is that they carry spin. And it's not obvious that we can ignore these two facts and get away with it, but it turns out that the crucial thing that allows us to do that is that we're only going to be talking about the ground state. So this is only going to work for the ground state. And for the excited states of helium, we're going to have to come back to that after we learn some more things about identical particles. And so for excited states, this won't work. It's horribly wrong to ignore the fact that the electrons are identical. And that's section 13.3. We will come back to that in more detail. OK, so um, our Hamiltonian for the helium atom consists of three parts. There's the Hamiltonian for one electron plus the Hamiltonian for the other electron plus the Hamiltonian for their interaction. And the first electron Hamiltonian is just its kinetic energy term times a Laplacian minus its attraction to the nucleus. And the same thing for electron two. Of course, it has the same mass, but it's got a different set of coordinates, uh, which tell you where it is. Okay, and so this is described by R1, this is described by R2, and then there's the Hamiltonian of the interaction between the two electrons, which is E squared over the difference in their positions. Okay, and that's the ugly and complicated part, which is going to cause us to spend the most time. Okay, and so last time I mentioned that we were going to do uh, perturbation theory and the variational method. Okay, so let's do perturbation theory first. We're gonna be doing first order perturbation theory. And because we're talking about the ground state, fortunately, there's no degenerate perturbation theory to be done here. And so we just have our zeroth order Hamiltonian is the sum of the things we can do exactly, H1 plus H2. We know the exact eigenpairs of that part of the Hamiltonian. And so if we're only interested in the ground state, all we care about is the lowest eigenvalue of H0. And that's going to be just a tensor product of the ground states of the two electrons, where they just are ignoring each other. And we can just call that state 100100. Zero, 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 zero. Okay, so now the the eigenvalue of H0, this is the unperturbed eigenvalue, so our notation for that is a curly E. Because the Hamiltonian is a linear operator, the Hamiltonian just acts first of all on this part and gives what it gives, and then it acts on this part and it gives what it gives. And so that is just two copies of the hydrogen-like 
unperturbed energies. And so that's two for two copies times minus z squared times a Rydberg, which is e squared over two times the Bohr radius. But now because the nucleus has charge z, which is two, this is equal to minus eight times a Rydberg energy. And so, and that's numerically 13.6 something something EV. And in fact, if you plug in the numbers, this is negative 108.85 electron volts. Okay, so by the way, I should mention what are we what are we actually we're computing the energy of the ground state, and you could say, how would you measure that experimentally? And one way would be the energy of the ground state corresponds to or is equal to the energy that it would take to take both of the electrons and just barely remove them from the helium atom. So if you, if you bombard this thing with photons or something like that, and you ask what's the minimum energy needed to get rid of both electrons, that would be this energy. That's how you could measure it. So it's needed to ionize both electrons. Okay, so we got as our very naive answer, we got negative 108.85 electron volts, but that's actually um, too big in magnitude because the electrons are actually repelling each other. And so when you remove them both, they're actually happy to fly away from each other happier than if they than if you ignore the interaction between them. And so the actual number is going to be smaller in magnitude than that. So let's compute it. And to compute it, we need to correct we need to compute the first order correction to the ground state energy. And perturbation theory tells us how to do that. We just compute the expectation value in our unperturbed state of the perturbation. So most of this is the 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 is just notation. And W is equal to our Hamiltonian H12. OK, so that's it. That's all we have to do is compute that matrix element, although that matrix element involves one very non-trivial integral. OK, so let's go ahead and do the integral. First, we'll write it all out. So we have a double position space integral to do. We're integrating over all positions of electron one and all positions of electron two. And we're multiplying by the wave function for electron one in the unperturbed state squared. And the same thing for the electron two in the unperturbed ground state multiplied by w, which in this case is e squared over the difference in the position vectors. OK, so that integral, uh, parts of that integral, we can write down immediately what to put. So first, we'll extract the constant, the e squared. And then we have. Let me just write my integrals again. Then we have the wave function squared, and I'm going to keep the z dependence, the nuclear charge dependence, because it will be convenient later. Okay, so I'm just writing down the hydrogen like ground state energy. That's for electron one square or wave function, I should say. And then the exact same thing for electron two. Fortunately, there is no angular dependence because it's the ground state. And then we have our complicated part in the denominator. Okay, and so let's isolate the part of this that's hard, 
The easy part is all the constants, which amount to e squared z to the sixth power over pi squared Bohr radius to the sixth power. And then there's an integral we have to do, which I'm going to call i of z. OK, and let's write down what i of z is. i of z is integral d3 r1, integral d3 r2, e to the minus 2 z r1 over Bohr radius. Another copy of that for electron 2, all divided by the magnitude of the distance between the electrons. OK, so we could, it might be tempting to plug in that z is 2 for helium, but let's not. And we'll see before the end of the day why it would be a bad mistake to plug in z equals 2 at this point. All right, so now this is a very hard integral. This is actually six, a six-fold integral. We're integrating over three things here and three things there. And this thing entangles them in such a way that it's, you can't separate them easily. So we're going to have to be very tricky. We're going to have to use two tricks. And so here's the first trick that we're going to use. We're going to take this horrible denominator factor and write it in the following way that should be familiar perhaps from electrostatics, that this is a sum over Legendre polynomials. So it's 1 over r greater sum l equals 0 to infinity, r less over r greater to the lth power times the lth Legendre polynomial of cosine gamma. So it may not be obvious that this is progress, but it will turn out to be progress. So first of all, r greater just means the maximum of r1 and r2. And since our, our wave functions are, are functions, that mean we don't know offhand which one is going to be larger, r1 or r2, depending on where we're integrating over. One or the other could be larger, and whichever is larger, we call that r greater. And similarly for r less, it's the minimum of the two. OK, and gamma is the angle between the two vectors. OK, so if I have, if r1 happens to be pointing like that, and r2 happens to be pointing like that, then in that case, r2 would be r greater, r1 would be r less, and that would be gamma. OK, so that's our first trick. And then our second trick is to has to do with the Legendre polynomial, because that can be written in terms of spherical harmonics. And in particular, it turns out to be 4 pi over 2L plus 1, sum over Ms, which can go from minus L to L. And then there's a, there's a spherical harmonic for theta 1, phi 1, and that's complex conjugated. And then there's a spherical harmonic for theta 2 and phi 2. Those are the two spherical coordinates for r1 and r2. OK, and so collectively, we can call this omega 1 and this omega 2. Those are just notations for the ordered pair theta 1 phi 1 and theta 2 phi 2. And the reason this is true, by the way, is this is the spherical coordinate or spherical harmonic addition formula. Which is in the notes from last semester, 7.6.59. OK, so those are our tricks. And now we're going to see why this helps by plugging those into the integral up here. So let's see how that will help us. So we have i of z 
equals, from here, we're going to be summing over m's, and from here, we're going to be summing over l's. So let's write our sums on the outside. So we have sum l equals zero to infinity, sum m equals minus l to l. There's our factor of four pi over two l plus one. Okay, and now we need to do, now we need to write down these D3R1s and D3R2s. Okay, so there's integral zero to infinity. I'm writing the integral over the radial coordinates first. Okay, and then from here we have some r graders and r lesses to put in. So let's do that. There is an r less to the lth power and an r greater to the l plus one power. Okay, and what else is there? There's the exponential parts from here. So we need to put those in. So that's e to the minus two z r1 plus r2 over the Bohr radius. But wait, there's more. We still have to integrate over omega one of y l m omega one complex conjugated and over omega two y l m omega two complex conjugated or no that one's not complex conjugated but it turns out it won't matter okay so now we've we've still got six integrations to do but now is where things get better is because if we stare at this integral this is the only integral that involves anything it's the only part that involves the angles of particle one and when we do this, when you integrate a spherical harmonic, it only gives a non-zero thing if L equals M equals zero, because there's nothing else with an angle here that would be multiplying it. Okay, so this part right here is fortunately only non-zero if L equals M equals zero. And that's really the basis of the whole trick that means that fortunately these sums up here are only going to have one term contributing and we can for example plug in l equals zero right away uh, right there and so we know what to plug in here and in fact when l equals zero gets plugged in this whole numerator is going to turn out to be just one okay and so things are going to get nice in fact even if that hadn't happened the same thing would have been true here so this is also only non-zero if L equals M equals zero. Okay, so that's the whole trick. And then because it's only non-zero for that one value, we can plug in what that value is for the YLMs. YLM for each of the omega I's is actually equal to y zero zero for each of the omega i's and the great thing about the zero zero spherical harmonic is it's a constant namely one over the square root of four pi okay and so when we do this each one of these integrals for example let's just take this one okay is going to give an integral d omega two times one over square root of four pi. This gives a square root of four, this gives a four pi. And so the whole thing is square root of four pi. And then the same thing for the other one. And so we are just gonna get two, we're just gonna get a factor of four pi, which is gonna combine with that four pi. Uh, 
Okay, and so let's write out the integral now that we've simplified it. So I of Z is now only one term, which has a four pi times another four pi. And now we have some integrals over R1 and R2. Oops. Okay, and what's left here is just the exponential factor. And now we have to divide this by whichever is larger, R1 or R2. Okay, so we've managed to get our six integrations down to just two integrations. And now to make progress, we need to divide these integrals into two parts. So I write this as my four pi quantity squared. I'm gonna be integrating over R1. And now let me split the R2 integral into a part where I integrate up to R1. And then what multiplies that is R1 squared, R2 squared over R1 because R1 is larger than R2 times my exponential. Okay, plus the same thing, let me put a parenthesis or a bracket here so I can keep my four pi squareds there. So now there's gonna be a, another integral over R1, but now it's the rest of the R2 integral, which is from R1 to infinity. Okay, and now it's R1 squared, R2 squared over R2, because this time R2 is larger than R1. So it's the R greater. Okay, and that's the end of the integral. So now finally, we've got it into integrals that you can actually look up. Uh, the original six dimensional integral is probably not so easy to find. Um, but so first you can do this R2 integral. It's not that hard. Then you plug that in to do the R1 integral. The fortunate thing about integrating exponentials times polynomials is you get exponentials times polynomials. Do the same thing for this, plug it in and do the same thing for that. And I'm gonna be skipping the details because now it's relatively straightforward and there's nothing tricky about it. You just have to get the arithmetic right. Okay, and so our integral, it turns out is, it's a function of z, or we're thinking of it as a function of z, even though we're gonna plug in z equals two. And what's left is it turns out a five pi squared Bohr radius to the sixth to the fifth power over eight z to the fifth. Okay, so now we've done the hard integral. What remains to do is to go back and plug that into our formula here. Notice this had a z to the sixth in the numerator and an a zero to the sixth in the denominator. So a lot of that's gonna cancel. Okay, and so when we plug in the zeroth order correction to the ground state of helium is e squared z to the sixth over pi squared Bohr radius to the sixth times five pi squared Bohr radius to the fifth over eight Z to the fifth, which simplifies to five Z E squared over eight times the Bohr radius. We could have told in advance that it would probably have to simplify to something like that because it's got to have units of energy and E squared over Bohr radius has units of energy. Okay, and that's pretty much the only energy you can construct out of the relevant quantities in the problem. And so this is uh, 
five halves, if I plug in z equals two finally, times a Rydberg. Okay, and so at first order in perturbation theory, okay, our total ground state energy is the unperturbed thing plus the first order correction. Okay, plus things we haven't computed because they're second order and the second order by the heart, by the way, is extremely difficult. Okay, and so you get minus eight for the unperturbed plus five halves from just above for the first order perturbation times a Rydberg in both cases. Okay, and so one thing to notice about this is if you're doing perturbation theory, you always want each higher order to be smaller than the preceding one. That's a sign that your series is actually converging instead of diverging or just not, not managing to converge. And so let's see how well we did. Um, so the first thing to notice is we got five halves instead of minus eight, and there's no small parameter multiplying the five halves. So this is not parametrically smaller. What do I mean by that? I mean, it could have been that it was some small thing like the fine structure constant. That's a small number, uh, but it's not. It's just a number happens to be five halves rather than minus eight. And so it's, it's smaller, but it's actually a 31.6% correction. That's what five over 16 is. And so if you think about, well, my, my first order term is only uh, barely less than a third of my starting term, you might worry that perturbation theory is not converging, or at least it's not converging very quickly. But it turns out this does better than you might think. So this turns out to be, you plug in the numbers, this is minus 74.83 electron volts. That's our estimate for the ground state of helium. And this turns out to be only about 5.3% from the true experimental value. So I'm defining true to be experimental. So maybe that's not too surprising. If I say, oh, this term was 31.6% uh, correction, then the next order term maybe would be the square of 31.6%, which would be about 10%. And so it did about twice as well as we might have naively guessed. Okay, but so that's our first estimate of the ground state energy of helium. Any any questions on that and before we go on to do the variational method? No? Okay. So our, we're going to now redo everything, but using the variational method. Okay, and this is treated in section 11.4. And so the first thing we need to do with a variational method is we need to invent some trial wave function, some parameterized sequence of guesses. And so we will try the following. I'm going to call it capital Psi. It's a wave function that depends on R1 and R2. And again, we're ignoring spin for reasons we explain later why we can get away with that. But we're just gonna take this to be the same thing as the unperturbed ground state wave functions. We just multiply together the two wave functions for the individual electrons. So where the little size for each of R1 and R2. And now I'm gonna write it as a function of another quantity called Z tilde. Okay, and it's just going to be exactly 
the ground state energy, or sorry, the ground state wave function, if there were no perturbation. So it looks like this. So this is ground state wave function. for a hydrogen-like atom with nuclear charge, which we are calling Z tilde. Okay, so it's tempting to plug in Z tilde equals two if we're talking about helium, but we're not going to do that because instead what we're doing with Z tilde is we're treating it as our variational parameter. Okay, so if in fact you could set, you could somehow magically turn off the interaction between the two electrons by setting H12 equals zero, then Z tilde equals two would be the exact answer. But as it is in the real world, we instead treat it as our variational parameter. So we're going to let it vary, parameter. We're going to let it vary and make it choose by itself what its, what its best value is for approximating um, the energy. Okay, and the strategy that we learned in the last couple of lectures is to do that. We want to compute E of Z tilde, which is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in our parameterized state divided by the norm. Okay, and in this case, I just happen to choose my parameterized state so that it had norm one, that was this factor here, right? And so I've already chosen it so that the denominator here is going to be one. And the only reason I did that is because we already know from our study of the hydrogen atom, what the normalization factor is that will make this one. So we might as well have just plugged it in since we already knew what it was. Okay, so our job is to compute that including H12. Now it's not a, not a perturbation, it's just part of the whole Hamiltonian. So the whole Hamiltonian goes in here. Okay, and then once we've computed it, we are supposed to minimize with respect to Z tilde. Okay, and then our E of the ground state will be E1 Z tilde plus E2 Z tilde plus E1 2 Z tilde, which we're going to compute separately. Okay, with Z tilde set equal to its minimum, the value that minimizes that thing. All right, so now we need to compute those three things and plug them in. So in doing so, first of all, those two things are going to be the same because there's no difference really between electron one and electron two. So if we compute it for one, the same calculation will give you the same thing for the other one. Since we're treating them symmetrically here, we gave them the same trial wave function. So we only have to compute one of those. Okay, and so let's do one of them. E1 of Z tilde is, all we have to do is compute the expectation value. So we're integrating over R1 and R2, and then there's psi, two, psi of R2 squared, and then there's psi, one, psi of R1, And now here's where we have to put in the Hamiltonian for electron one. 
And then there's psi of R1 again. Okay, and actually this, this technically should have been complex conjugated, but because we're talking about the ground state, the wave function has, happens to be real anyway. And so that doesn't make any difference. So once again, we have a six, a six dimensional integral to do, but fortunately this one is much, much easier because this part is the only part that involves R2 and by normalization, that's just equal to one. We chose our wave function to make that be true. And so the rest of it is just evaluating the expectation value for a single electron, which is the same calculation as for the hydrogen atom. And so in fact, when you do it, you just have to be, be careful to keep the Z tilde dependence. And so this is E squared Z tilde squared over twice the Bohr radius from the first term minus two E squared Z tilde over the Bohr radius for the second term. Okay. All right. Oh, actually this should have been right here. Let me fix this. That should have been a minus n. Okay, because the electrons are attracting each other. This is the zeroth order part of the Hamiltonian. That's why this part gives this negative contribution proportional to Z tilde. Notice this too is the true Z of the helium atoms. That's why we're plugging in two for it, not Z tilde, because Z tilde is a parameter that we're allowed to vary. This two is the Z that's fixed. We could have called it just Z uh, rather than Z tilde. Okay. So that's E1, and then you get the same thing for Z2, for E2. So same for E2 of Z tilde. And so now we have to do the hard part, which is the E1, 2 part. So E1, 2 as a function of Z tilde is once again, a six dimensional integration, which looks like this. Then there's psi of R1, there's psi of R2, and there's one over R1 minus R2 in the denominator. Okay, and if we want, we can rewrite that as pulling out all the constants. There's an E squared Z tilde cubed over pi Bohr radius cubed. And then this integral is what's left over. E to the minus Z tilde R1 plus R2, actually e to the minus two Z tilde, R1 plus R2 over Bohr radius divided by R1 minus R2. Okay, so we have to do that hard integral, but now justice prevails because that hard integral is exactly the same hard integral we did earlier today. That is what we called I except that now it's not a function of Z, it's a function of Z tilde, our variational parameter, but otherwise it's exactly the same. And so we don't have to redo it. Okay, and so that is equal to, or so now we can plug in for the whole thing. This is five E squared Z tilde over eight times the Bohr radius. Okay, it's basically the exact same calculation we did before. But now when we put things together in the variational method, we're gonna get a different answer. So put everything together. Okay, and we've got E of Z tilde 
is E squared over Bohr radius Z tilde squared minus four E squared Z tilde over Bohr radius. That was from the E1 and E2 terms. And now we have plus five E squared Z tilde over Bohr radius. That was from the E1, two term. And it's convenient to combine those. So there's E squared over Bohr radius times Z tilde squared minus turns out to be 27 eighths uh, Z tilde. And this should have been an eight that explains where the eight came from in the denominator. Okay, so that's our energy for our parametrized wave function. And now we're, now we're supposed to minimize that. So we minimize by doing the derivative and setting it equal to zero. And that tells us that the value that gives us the minimum is 27 sixteenths, which is approximately 1.69. So in retrospect, we can tell why it should have been uh, a number between one and two. There's a physical interpretation of this. So one less than Z tilde less than two is what we should expect because each electron is screening the other, the, the other electron from the nucleus. So each electron screens the nucleus from the other to some extent. because sometimes one electron is closer to the nucleus than the other electron. And so it sort of mitigates the amount of charge that the other one sees. And these are distributions are spherically symmetric. So you would have expected that sometimes you'll see the full charge, charge two nucleus, and sometimes you'll see the charge two nucleus minus a bit from the other electron being closer. And so you would have expected it maybe to be between one and two, and of course it is. Okay, so that's good. So now we can go ahead and plug in the numbers for the energy. So then the energy evaluated at the minimum value, at the value that gives the minimum is negative 27 sixteenths squared, E squared over Bohr radius. Okay, which is about minus 2.848 E squared over Bohr radius. Okay, which turns out to be about minus 77.49 electron volts. So that's our variational principle estimate of the ground state energy of helium. So now let's make a little table where we compare all the different values we've got. I'm sorry, Professor? Yes. You said because each electron screened the nucleus from the other? Right. What's that mean? So let's, uh, let's draw a little picture here. Here's our doubly charged nucleus. Here's one of our electrons, right? And let's say the other electron is closer. Okay, so this electron here is going to see, is going to be attracted by two charges from this, but this is screened by a negative charge from that one. And so effectively, it's going to be seeing less than the two charges that it would normally see if you ignored this electron. Okay, okay on the other hand, this electron uh, if you think of this electron here as being a spherically symmetric cloud of probability outside, then some of the time this electron won't see it because the outside part doesn't count by Gauss's law. Well, okay. it won't push that inner electron further in? That's correct. If this is a spherically symmetric distribution, then Gauss's law tells you 
this is just sort of a, a classical electrostatic uh, discussion of this, that this one will ignore it and just be attracted by the full charge two, whereas this one will be attracted by effectively charge minus charge one from that electron, except that sometimes this electron will be outside. Okay, and so when you do quantum mechanics is sort of doing the average for you and telling you that at least at this, at this level in the variational principle, the average charge that one of the electrons sees turns out to be 1.69 rather than two. But my question is, won't that inner electron be pushed further in because of that outer electron cloud? No, because the outer, the, both electron clouds are spherically symmetric. And when you have a spherically symmetric distribution, anything inside of it doesn't get affected. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so, so let's make our little chart here of helium ground state energy in electron volts. Okay, and so the first thing is the zeroth order in perturbation theory. Okay, and for that we got negative 108.85. That was the very naive thing where we just ignored the interaction of the electrons with each other. Then we did first order in perturbation theory. And we got negative 74.83. And then we did the variational principle. And we got negative 77.49. And then there's the exact experimental value, which turns out to be negative 79.01. So if you look at what the, what the um, errors were, this was about a 5.3% error. And this was about a 2% error. So the variational principle wins and it wins by more than twice, it's more than twice as good. But even better than that is what happens if you decide you wanna do much better, I suppose your life depended on getting a really exact value for the helium atom. It turns out going beyond first order and perturbation theory is really much harder. For the variational principle, all you have to do is, uh, so to do better, all you have to do is invent a slightly more complicated wave function with more moving parts, more parameters in it. And then you tell your computer, search through all those parameters and find the best one, the one that gives me the minimum value. Notice this value is larger than that value because of the minus sign. And so you're always guaranteed that you'll be larger than the experimental value, but the amount by which you'll be larger is going to decrease if you just make a more complicated uh, wave function. So just choose a more general wave function with more parameters and have your computer minimize it. And so this also generalizes to cases where uh, let's say I wasn't doing helium, but let's say I was doing something ambitious with an atom like uh, that has say 12 electrons in it, then perturbation theory is going to be really hard and possibly not converge very well. But the variational principle, as long as I choose some sort of wave function that has lots of parts to it, I just tell my computer, go ahead, compute, compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian minimize it just but if necessary just search over all the variational parameters by brute force using some grid or something and you'll get some reasonable answer so this generalizes much better to um, to things like atomic physics and even molecular physics uh, and the more complicated things are the better the variational principle will do relative to perturbation theory 
Okay, so that's actually all we're going to say about the variational principle for a while. Next time we're going to go back to an application of perturbation theory, which is going to be uh, the fine structure of the hydrogen atom. So this is going to be, so fine structure of the hydrogen atom. This is going to be a great way to uh, apply the things we've learned about perturbation theory to a real world example where you can do lots of fun comparisons with experiment. Okay, so we'll do that next time. Tomorrow evening, you owe me another homework, homework three. And homework four is now on the web page for whenever you want to download. All right, any other questions on today's lecture? So basically, Professor, going back to that question is, can I, so in a nutshell, the inner electron pushes out the outer electron, but the outer electron doesn't have any effect on the inner electron, correct? That's right, in the sense that we're treating them both really as, I drew them as points here, but really in quantum mechanics, we're thinking of these as spherically symmetric clouds of probability distribution, right? And so if I have a spherically symmetric cloud of probability distribution, and I'm at some other point and I ask, what is the, uh, what is the effect on an electron from a spherically symmetric cloud distribution? The only thing that matters is what's inside where that electron is. Because what I was thinking, I was thinking if, if the inner electron has a repulsion on the outer electron, then the outer electron, wouldn't that also have a repulsion on the inner electron and push it further in? Because they're both uh, clouds at the end of the day, no? Right, so as long as you're treating them as spherically symmetric distributions, right? It's a principle of electrostatics that when you have a spherically symmetric distribution and then you choose some point and you ask what's the electric field at that point, by Gauss's law, the answer only depends on what's happening inside closer to the origin of the spherically symmetric distribution uh, for that point. Could you say that last sentence again, please? Okay, so what, the only thing that matters is when you have a spherically symmetric charge distribution is what's happening closer to at any given point is what's happening closer than that point to the origin. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure.